Good evening. Happy Sabbath. Uh, we're going to continue our study on uh, the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. But before we begin, could we have a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath and for the time that we have to study your word together. We invite your spirit's presence as we look at the past and see how it parallels the present. We pray for wisdom and understanding. And we pray, Lord, that um, you can be with each person who is seeking truth. We ask that we can reflect your character to those around us and that as we study together, your spirit will unite our hearts and minds that we can understand the things we are studying. Again, we are thankful for the Sabbath, the blessing of your presence in this day. And uh, we pray for all the meetings that are going on uh, today, tomorrow. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you can lead and guide, that you can bring us together uh, through thy spirit. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath, everyone. And uh, welcome to White here. He's here now. So this is a statement you brought up yes, uh, last Sabbath, right, Dwight? Yeah. Now, this is um, – uh, I, I did some research. So this is a telegraph – from telegram. telegram, yeah. Telegram. Shut that door, dear. Or shut the window. Um, yeah, from Brother Caldwell to Ellen White. So he is writing her and asking for an answer about what he's studying. Had had you picked up on that? I hadn't. Okay. Yeah, so Ellen White writes this um, about this, what was happening with Brother Caldwell and Brother Stanton. And uh, so this would have been in 1893, from what I can gather. Um, so, so we bring this up because this is addressing Chicago's World Fair. So, um, so he's writing Ellen White. She's in Banks, Terrence, Wellington. Um, and he writes, when former rain came, devout men, all nations there, Isaiah 66, 18, 19, Chicago Fair dedicated May 14, which it wasn't. It was dedicated October 21st, 1892, so 205 days before he says it was. Greatest number of devout men present. Their sacred year began April 16th. It would have begun April 18th. First month closes May 16th, which would have closed May 18th. Last, I'm not sure what he means by last. Um, and Joel 2.23, which is the one talking about the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. People asleep for love of Jesus, Joel 1.14, and Zephaniah 2.1-3. Um, answer good or bad quick. So... So this is him sending a telegram, telegram to Alan White. Now, it says here, now this is by W.C. White, Lee White. In answer to this telegram and letters that followed, letters were sent to Brother Caldwell and Brother Stanton. Reviewer articles were prepared, and these are reprinted in Testimonies to Ministers 32 to 62. So um, so there was an issue going on, which I'm not going to look into in detail here at this moment, but we, we will come back to this at some point. So basically they were calling the Adventist Church Babylon, calling people to come out of Adventism, and using Ellen White's writings to do so. So does that help a little bit with the context, Dwight? It gives a little more background. Yeah, because at first I thought it was Alan White's statement, right? But um, it didn't make sense, so 
if I would have read a little bit further, I would have seen that. Okay, so um, so we're still dealing with this Chicago's World Fair. And I need to do that. The key point on a World's Fair to keep in mind is that they're only allowed to run for six months. Okay, they're only allowed to run for six months. Correct. And so uh, they did, I guess, technically the six months is a certain number of days because they ended on October 30th instead of 31st. I'm not sure why. I, I have no idea as to why they ended when they did. Yeah. Okay. That would explain why um, uh, they just ran six months. They were only allowed to. Um, and um, yeah, so that number of days that the fair ran uh, was 183 days. So maybe that's the amount of days they're allowed to operate. So that maybe they couldn't go to the 31st. I don't know. But that's, that's how it was done. So, um, <clears throat> so getting back to Jones here. Now, wh what we're seeing is that Jones is looking at, uh, this is a study on righteousness by faith, the, three, the third angel's message of righteousness by faith. And he's addressing the, the current events. And why is he addressing current events when he's doing a study on righteousness by faith? Why is he not doing a study on the nature of Christ or talking about overcoming sin? Why is he focused upon um, this issue of, of the world's fair? Wouldn't he be looking at how the third angel's message should be being presented? Okay, right. So he's looking at how the third angel's message is going to go. That is, he understands that the third angel's message of righteousness by faith is in the context of the Sunday law. We had the first and second angel's messages um, in Millerite history, and now we're under the proclamation of the third. Jones understands that, and he understands that the third angel's message is a message about the mark of the beast and that God's people need to be sealed. Right. So righteousness by faith is is understood in that context. Now, for for the vast majority of the Christian world, when they study righteousness by faith, they're not studying it in the context of the Sunday law. And, and the question is, um, how does it change our understanding of righteousness by faith if we're studying it in the context of the Sunday law? What, what's the difference then about righteousness by faith for Seventh-day Adventists compared to righteousness by faith for non-Adventists? Many times within our study of righteousness by faith, we are focused more on what Rome is doing versus what is occurring within our own lives. Okay. So, and, and here Jones isn't dealing so much with Rome as he is with the United States. Right. But um, we, we see that they the two go hand in hand. I mean, we need to understand the issues around us in order to understand what righteousness by faith means to us. I mean, I, I'm a person who's presented righteousness by faith for years. 
um, you know, through the latter half of the 80s, um, all the way up to um, about 2000, about 2004, I would have been constant about a period of 20 years. I was constantly presenting righteousness by faith. Um, I wasn't presenting much about the Sunday law. I mean, I might be talking a little bit about it in the context of the 144,000 and the character that they need, but I wasn't really looking at what was happening uh, prophetically around me. That, that was me anyway. I, I was much more interested in the nature of Christ um, and what Ellen White had to say and what Jones and Wagner had to say regarding righteousness by faith. It wasn't until I got into this movement, and that would have been 2010, that I really started taking a, a much more serious look at prophecy. Obviously, I was interested in the 2300 days and the 70 weeks, but I wasn't really interested in prophecy that was fulfilling around us. That is my, my position, which, which I don't agree with anymore, but at the time was uh, that we needed to focus just upon um, the message of righteousness by faith. Now, what, what's wrong with that idea? Because J- Jones doesn't do that. So, so what's wrong with the idea of just presenting the message of righteousness by faith and ignoring the prophecies, especially present fulfillment of prophecy? Or maybe you don't think there's anything wrong with that. Doesn't it take it out of context? Okay, out of context. Explain how. How does it take it out of context? <clears throat> with prophecy, it adds more to it. Okay, so definitely prophecy adds more to it. Um, and we know that because we experience something. That is, if we look at the three angels' messages... And we talk about the third angel's message is righteousness by faith and verity. And yet when you look at the third angel's message, it doesn't really say anything about faith except to the last part. Um, The last part, well, and that would actually be, uh, if we go here, um, Revelation 14. Um. You know, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have and, and the faith of Jesus. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And But all this other stuff, talking about the smoke of their torment ascending up forever and ever, the beast in his image and receiving the mark of his name, uh, the wrath of God, um, all these things that are talked about in the third angel's message. Um we generally, and I shouldn't say generally, I mean, different Adventists do different things. But often, if we're presenting righteousness by faith, we're not presenting it in that context. Maybe just a hint of it. We know that there's the Sunday law coming and that we need righteousness by faith. We need righteousness in order to stand uh, in the time that's ahead of us. So what what is Jones doing? Why is he going over this history? I mean, we we said the one thing is because of how we're going to uh, proclaim the message, the third angel's message, and he's looking at how that is done. Any any other reasons why Jones is doing what he's doing? Now, Jones has been a proponent of the message of righteousness by faith since about 1886, I think. Is that about when him and Wagner began presenting the message of righteousness by faith? Anybody know? I think it's about 1886, if I remember correctly. And, and now he's in, what's that? 
I'll just say a couple of years before the 1888 right. speech. Yeah, so it's a couple of years before the conference in 1888 in uh, Minneapolis. Um, we know definitely in 1887 um, we're going to have uh, G.I. Butler write a study on the book of Galatians that Wagner is then going to respond to. Uh, but it's going to all come to a head in 1888. And, and I can't remember when Jones and uh, Jones and Wagner, I know Jones, they were working on the signs of the times. So I'm not sure when they became editors or when Joe, who was the editor specifically. I think it was Jones. Um, but they have this, this message. And now we know what happened in 1888. Jones had uh, dealt with uh, the Blair Bill. And now in 1893, 1892, he's addressing um, the World's Fair. So Jones has this message of righteousness by faith, but he's also uh, the strongest proponent of religious liberty. Is that just a coincidence? No. Okay. Can you explain why it's not? Once Jones came to an understanding of righteous, righteousness by faith, he understood that in order for this message to go out, it had to go out under freedom and not under suppression. And, and actually the message of righteousness by faith is a message that actually directly relates to religious liberty. Correct. That is, Jones understands, and, and, and we're going to delve into this a little bit, but he understands that um, righteousness by faith is not just some theoretical idea. It's actually a very, very practical uh, application of the gospel. It's an understanding of the gospel and, and that God has given us the freedom to choose that his people are making a choice under the proclamation of this message. They're choosing to either receive the seal of God or the mark of the beast. So righteousness by faith is directly related to the seal of God. We would agree with that. Most definitely. And that the seal of God is connected to the Sabbath. It has to be. Right. The Sabbath is a sign, as it says in um, Exodus 31, 13 and uh, Ezekiel 21, 12, or 2012 and 2020, that God has given us the Sabbath as a sign between us and him that we may know that uh, he, the Lord, he's the one that sanctifies us or makes us holy. So it's a sign of sanctification. So righteousness by faith is, is not just some doctrine that Jones is interested in. It's actually the very thing of Adventism. And, and it's kind of odd because many people consider that because Adventists keep the Sabbath, that they're legalists, that they know nothing about righteousness by faith, and that they're trying to earn their way into heaven by works. This is a common misconception that people have regarding Adventism. And maybe in some ways it's not totally a misconception because there are many Adventists with that mindset. But we know that once we understand the Sabbath uh, in, in the biblical sense of what the Sabbath is about, uh, we understand that it is about righteousness by faith. Who is it that we're trusting? Those who receive the mark of the beast, they don't have righteousness by faith. And those that receive the seal of God do. 
So now Jones is looking at this issue, but he's, he's examining it in a way that many Adventists hadn't examined it. That is, he's, he's going to show that the third angel's message is about righteousness by faith because it's about the Sabbath Sunday issue. So that's what he's doing. And so he's approaching it from the current events of the day, but he's doing it because he has a purpose to get them to think about what righteousness by faith is. That is, Jones has been a proponent of righteousness by faith, and he's been a champion on religious liberty. But there's a lot of prejudice against his views on righteousness by faith. That is, many people felt that Jones and Wagner were undermining the message, the third angel's message, by their emphasis upon righteousness by faith. Um, and especially, specifically with Jones, but also with Wagner, the view of the law in the book of Galatians. So we had taken a position that the law in Galatians is the ceremonial law, and it was one of our um, ways in which we beat up our opponents uh, in their arguments. So we would make this argument that the law is not done away, that the law that is done away is the ceremonial law, and uh, the moral law is, is binding. And so um, the idea that Jones and Wagner were teaching is that the, that the law in Galatians is the moral law, or at least includes the moral law, um, this seemed to be taking away one of the arguments that uh, our ministers had in their debating with others. But the thing is, they actually are the ones who are uh, weakening the message in their understanding of the law in Galatians. And Jones is now going to have to present to these people who have this prejudice, he's going to present to them uh, the issue of righteousness by faith, but he's going to do it by addressing the issues that they are interested in, which is the coming Sunday law. People are interested in this topic. And so Jones is going to do a roundabout way to present something that there's prejudice. So that's one of the reasons that he's doing it. It's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons that he's presenting things in this way. So now we're going to go on. It says, now that thing is done. So the thing that is done in his mind, which we, uh, I think we pointed out last week, was a bit of an exaggeration that the issue is all done. And, and, and of course, it's not all done. I mean, the Sunday law didn't come in. But Jones is looking at what's happening now, and he's, th he's saying that it, it's, it's all done. But it doesn't destroy his point or his argument that he's making. Because his main argument is not so much that it's done, even though he's talking about that, but he's leading to an understanding of what God is doing and what our responsibility is. That is, in order to, um, in order to proclaim righteousness by faith, we also have to proclaim religious liberty. And not just religious liberty for ourselves, but li religious liberty for our fellow man. So anyway, let's go on and read it and we'll discuss this a bit more. Now that thing is done and there is no more protesting against the doing of it, but it is all, but is all our work done now? Have we nothing more to do in the world? Does all our work stop now and we have nothing more to do in the world? No. Our work is not stopped. We have a work to do. But that our work cannot be done in that way anymore. We're talking about doing petitions. But that which is done is the making of the image of the beast. Then does not that bring us face to face with the third angel's message as it reads in words? Does not this bring you and me and shut us up? to the third angel's message as it reads. There's no outlet but that to speak 
the third angel's message as it reads in words against the thing that has been done. The third angel's message reads in words. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, then does not that show in itself that the image is there and that the mark is set up to be received. I say again, we cannot protest against the doing of the thing because it has already been done. We cannot go to Congress and use constitutional arguments against religious legislation. We cannot protest against the making of the image to the beast. We cannot protest against the government recognizing the false Sabbath that is set up and it is put in place of the Sabbath uh, that is set up and is put in place of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment by the definite act of Congress itself. Then that action has put the government of the United States into the hands of the churches. It has established the mark of the beast as the Sabbath of the nation and for all the world, and it has done it in place of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment in express words in the legislation. Now, we know that in our history, we have this pandemic that is a type of the Sunday law. But it's not the Sunday law. Could we argue that was what was happening in 1893 that Jones is talking about, that it's a type of the Sunday law that's to come, that is the Blair Bill and this um, Chicago World's Fair, the Sunday issues there, that these are these are typifying something happening in the future. Could we make that argument? How could we not? Okay, right. Because we have the Chicago World's Fair in the United States, this um, World Columbian Exposition, or exhibition, whatever it is, exhibition. Um, so we have this, and, and, and what happened with the Blair Bill, these are typical, that is, and we've already established that, haven't we already established that 1888 is typical? I believe you're correct. Yeah. And, and that we took 1888 and we, we counted 126 years and we came to 2014, right? And because we had counted 126 years from 1863 to um, 1989. And so, so we did the same thing here with uh, 1888 and 151 years, of course, to 2014 from 1863. So we had these two witnesses, and Jeff clearly marked these out uh, on a line for us. So we, so we understand that this was taking what was happening in 1888 and also 1863, but we can also say 1893. And so we have this period from 1888 to 1893 that's that's addressing this issue of Sunday, not typically. Now, uh, Angela's pointing out from 1893 to 2019 is 126 years. So, so we can take what was happening then and we can put it into our history. And 2019, November 2019, is going to start this pandemic. So, we can say that there's a parallel between the pandemic and issues that have happened internally within the movement to what was happening within the Adventist church and also what was happening in the world. I mean, to me, it's clear. Is it clear to everyone else that we can do that? And anybody have a problem with it? Okay. I think it's so, a problem at this point. 
What's that? No problem? I ain't, I ain't got a problem with it right now. No. Okay. Oh, what happened in 19, 1893 again? Well, 1893 is the World's Fair. Oh, that's right. Okay. Right. So okay. that's what Jones is addressing here. Right. Okay. And, and, and so we have this World's Fair. We had uh, the Blair Bill in 1888. So we had these issues dealing with the Sunday. And, and Jones is looking at this as this is it, right? Just like we looked at the pandemic, we would look at what's happening with the government and we would say the government has stepped its bound, bounds. It's, it's set aside the constitution and it's come up with all these mandates and, and which are unconstitutional, definitely. And so this is it, but it wasn't it. The thing was not done in 1888 or 1893. And, and so we're, we're in that same situation now. <clears throat> Sorry about that. My mic fell over. Um, So, okay, so um, I'm just going to go back here. I don't know what happened. Where did I, I must have, where was I? I didn't read this. Okay, this is where we are, isn't it? Okay, what was the papacy? It was not simply the union of religion and state. That was there in paganism. The papacy is the church ruling the state. Um, um, the church in possession of the state and the powers of the state and using them to enforce church decrees. So what's he saying here? We have church and state that has always existed with these pagan religions, right? Agreed. Now, the papacy is the church ruling the state. So before, we had a mixture of church and state. But here, the church is, is in possession of the state and the powers of the state and using them to enforce church decrees. So before, in a sense, the, the state was controlling the church. Would we say that that's how it was before? Under paganism, the state, that is, the king or the, the, the head of that government, he is, pagan. what's that? Yeah. Pagan Rome was, I would say, yeah, pagan Rome was the yeah. leading out. So you have the Victor. state, the, the head, the king, the government is the state, and it's enforcing a religion that is a state religion. But in the papacy, what you end up having is the church is going to be separate and it's going to rule the state. So there's a difference here. Would, would we agree with what Jones is saying? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> It is a literal fact that the government of the United States is now confirmed in the hands of the professed Protestant churches and that they are using it to enforce a church decree above all other decrees. That is what they did it for. That is what they are now doing. Is that like the papacy? Does that look like the papacy? Yes, sir. So I say again, we are therefore shut up to the third angel's message. The facts are before our faces, and we are shut up to that as only as our only work. If we are to have any conviction, connection at all with public affairs, we have got to have it in some other way than that in which we had hitherto. And the only way in which we can have any connection with them at all is just simply to warn people against receiving or admitting the rightfulness of the thing 
that is done, right? So our message is not about trying to change the government to change their mind, but to present a message to warn people. We are shut up to that one thing, and there is no other way out. Every man from this day forth who professes to work in the third angel's message can carry that message or give that message in no other way than in the words which that message speaks. If any man worship the beast and his image. But never before 1892 had one of us the right to say that and warn the people against the worship of the image because the image was not yet made. We've told the people that it was coming and that when certain things came, the image would be made and the warning then would be, do not worship it. That has been our message, but that is not our message anymore. We cannot tell them that now. We cannot protest against the making of it. We cannot do that now. That thing is done. We are shut up, therefore, to this one thing I say again. There is no way out but to preach the third angel's message as it reads, if any man worship the beast and his image. But there is a word there that comes just before that. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, What is that then but the loud cry of the third angel's message coming right in now? Does not that show us that when the time comes for the message to be given directly as it reads in words, but the loud cry is right at that time? We have had enough before us and all these other things to show that, but it is not there in the words of the message itself, that when the message goes to the world in the words in which it is given, that is the loud cry. For it goes that way with a loud voice. Now another thought. How many of the nations of earth besides this were there until this time that had no union of religion and state? None. How many nations at all are there now that have it not? None. But a union of religion and the state a union of church and state, that is, Satan's way of doing things. Paganism was Satan's way of doing things, and so was the papacy. And what is this now in our own nation, the image of the papacy? Through what instrument did Satan make war against the church of God when Christ was born? Through paganism. Through what instrument did he make war against the church in the wilderness? Through the papacy. Through what instrument does he make war against the remnant? Through the image of the papacy. See Revelation 12. But until now, the image was not made. Now it is made. Until now, he did not have the government of the United States in his hands to wield against the truth of God. He has it now. How much then of the power of the world has Satan now in his hands to wield against the church and the Sabbath of God? He has it all hasn't he? Now you and I are pledged by years of profession to stand by the Sabbath of the Lord. We are pledged to that. But now, but now opposed to this is every particle of power that this earth knows, with Satan the chief to wield the power. Then we are not brought, then are we not brought face to face with this fact, that as certainly as we maintain our allegiance to the Sabbath of the Lord, we shall have to do it in the face of all the power that this earth knows. Then does it not follow that in order to do that, we must have with us a power that is greater than all the power that this earth knows? Can a man of himself stand successfully against all the power of earth? No, sir. Well, then, are we not shut up in this, that we must have the power working for us that is greater than all the power of the earth put together? Is it not time then that the angel should come down from heaven having great power? So just to go and backtrack a little bit on what Jones is saying, and we can see why he's come to this point. So we know that um, Jones has this position that the image of the beast has already been made. Now, we know that that's not the case. But in our history, 
we, we are looking for the image of the beast. And, and the question is, has the image of the beast been made in our time, or is it similar to what happened in Joan's time? Anybody with a thought on that? And anybody arguing that the image of the beast has already been made in our time? Wouldn't something like this have already been proceeding in darkness? Okay. So, so we know things are proceeding in darkness, and we know that that was the case in 2001. Some people have argued, well, you know, no Sunday law came in 2001. We were expecting it. Instead, we had 9-11. That didn't bring about a Sunday law. But it did bring about uh, legislation that was definitely um, the government overstepping its bounds in order to people have a false sense of security. And they had been preparing that for a while. It was... Uh, What's it called again? The act. Um, Patriot Act. Yeah, well, Patriot Act. Yes. So the Patriot Act. So that had been was in the works before two thousand one, but once two thousand one came, of course, they just put it into into place. And so we have this progression that has been occurring. Now, when it comes to the image of the beast. Where does Jeff place the image of the beast? And, and what, what, what were the, the conditions that we would have to have in place to know that the image of the beast has, has been formed? Does anybody know what those conditions are? And where on the line the image of the beast occurs? A rejection of the first and second, second angel message. Okay. Um, so, the, well, the image of the beast is something that happens in with the combination of church and state. Um, what way marks did Jeff place the image of the beast between? So he didn't place it as one of the way marks, but he, he took some way marks and placed it between them. Would we agree that the image of the beast is formed before the Sunday Sunday law? Yeah, definitely. Okay. And it's going to be a test that occurs before the Sunday law, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, does it come between midnight, the midnight cry and the Sunday law, or does it come before the midnight cry? Because it comes before the Sunday law, but is it after the midnight cry, or does it occur before the midnight? I would, I would say before. Okay, and what would be your reasoning? Um, the time you get the midnight cry, I don't know. Well, isn't the midnight cry war a warning about the beast and his image? Yeah, yes. And isn't Jones kind of saying here that in order to give the loud cry, that the beast and his image, the image of the beast, must be already formed in order to give that? Yeah, I remember that. So it would have to occur um, after the midnight cry is given. Or after we come to that way mark, or, okay. or at least has to be in connection with that. So maybe to ask if it's before or after, because it could be a little bit before, it could be a little bit after. But it's in connection with the midnight cry way mark. That is, when you're giving the midnight cry, you're saying that the image of the beast has been formed. And so the image of the beast must be formed, be, be formed before you can give the warning of it. 
in the way that Jones is talking about, right? So Jones is talking about this change in the message that we're moving from just being under the proclamation of the third angel's message, but we're now going to have the loud cry. So the loud cry would parallel the midnight cry. And, and notice that, jo that Jones, though, um, Ellen White has the Sunday law first and the loud cry following after, correct? Yes. Yeah, because she has Revelation 18, the mighty angel comes down, he joins yeah. with the third angel, it's the second angel, and then it's going to swell into a loud cry. And she marks Revelation 18 as the Sunday law. So Jones has a difference here with spirit of prophecy because now he's sort of saying that the Sunday law has already happened. That is, he, he connects the image of the beast and the Sunday law together. He doesn't see them as separate way marks or separate events. Right. So, so in some ways he's, he's agreeing with spirit of prophecy, but in some ways he's not. <clears throat> Now, as we pointed out, Jones is wrong about the image of the beast having been formed. So we know the image of the beast is still future, unless we are saying that the image of the beast was formed in the pandemic. But we take the pandemic as a type of the Sunday law, not as the Sunday law itself. And, and, and the question is, where are we in the way marks? Are we... If, if we believe the image of the beast was formed, then we should be giving a message that's the loud cry. Is this movement giving the loud cry at the present time? Okay, let's, let's read on as we think about that question. That angel coming down and adding his voice to the other makes the loud cry. So this angel coming down is the angel of Revelation 18, right? So he's talking about this angel coming down and adding his voice to the other that makes the loud cry. We therefore just now at the point where that angel has come down with great power and we need not be afraid so jones is saying that revelation 18 has just been fulfilled is he correct but for his his time i mean his ah okay right so in some ways, he is correct. Yeah, some ways, right. But he's not in a repeat of history. He's in a prefiguring of history, right? That is, yeah. we had 1888, and, and the question was, 1888 is the third angel's message was given. If the, if the third angel's message had been given, would the Seventh-day Adventist church have been in a different situation in 1893 if they had accepted Jones and Wagner's message. Wouldn't, wouldn't the Sunday law have come sooner? Wouldn't the real Sunday law have come? Yes, it would have, and Christ would have now, now, what would have changed? What would have been different that would have caused the Sunday law, the real Sunday law, to come sooner if the message of righteousness by faith had been accepted? What would be different? Would the world be different? No, would the church's attitude would be different? Oh, the church would be different, wouldn't it? If the, if the church had received the message of righteousness by faith, if it was in 
a condition to do so, if it had been want to do so, if it had accepted that message, the church would have been different. And the response to the world would have had, would have to um, address that difference of Adventists. That is, the Sunday law would have come, right? Now, what do Adventists usually want to have happen in order for um, us to be able to give a powerful message? What is it we're looking for first? We're looking, we're looking for the outpouring. Okay, we're looking for the outpouring. We're looking for the outpouring. Um, yeah. So back in the 1980s, in the upper room studies that I had in my attic, you know, we were studying about uh, the latter rain, the outpouring of the latter rain, because we have a Sunday law coming. But for most Adventists, aren't they just waiting for the Sunday law itself? When the Sunday law comes, then I'm going to get serious. Isn't that how most Adventists think about the Sunday law? Yeah, it seems to be. Mm -hmm. it seems to be. Yeah, that's that's what we're waiting for. The Sunday law comes, we know which side we're going to stand on, and then we can give the loud cry. But we have a midnight cry that precedes the Sunday law. We, we have a loud cry that follows. Now, the midnight cry that precedes the Sunday law is because there's going to be an image to the beast that precedes the Sunday law. That is, that midnight cry that we have, which is directly related to a message to the Levites, is typical of the loud cry that's going to follow. I'm going to draw this on the board. I haven't drawn anything on the board since I moved here. Um, <clears throat> so i got to get this set up. Just hang on. Okay, so what we have is a line. Hopefully this looks okay. And I'm going to try to get this here. So we have... Uh, 1844, third angel arrives, and we're going to have, um, under this third angel, we're going to have a rejection of the first and second angel's message. So I'm just going to put here 1863, that's going to be the first angel is rejected. Can you see that? Is that big enough? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. And then in 1888, we're going to have the sec, uh, pardon me. So, pardon me, this is the first angel. This is going to be the third angel. When's the second angel? Um, this is the second angel's message is rejected. Pardon me. When's the first angel's message rejected? Now, these angels are for the, for the, uh, Conference, Seventh-day Adventists, right? Yeah, so Adventism is going to reject these messages. So it's going to be 18, because this isn't a rejection of the first angel's message, or is it? How about if I put 1856? The first angel is rejected. I don't know. Maybe this doesn't make sense to people. Anybody want to argue with this? I mean, maybe these dates are somewhat a little, little bit arbitrary. What happens in 1856? I remember since articles on the seven times. Okay, seven times. Okay. So are they going to accept his articles? No. Now, there's going to be a period of seven years, and then they're going to have the 1863 chart. And why, why do I say the second angel is rejected? 
Because is it just the 2520 that's being rejected here? No, it's not. They're rejecting the chart, the foundation. Yeah, they're rejecting the first, uh, the first chart and the second chart, right? Yeah, yeah. And then we're going to have the third angels. So the first and second angels' messages are rejected. So are they going to be able to accept the third angel's message? Nope. No, they can't possibly. Nope. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then in 1893, they should have had, in this history, this is going to be uh, this Sunday law issue, right? Now, Jones is saying the image of the beast has been formed. But the church has rejected this message. The image of the beast is formed in response to what happens here. So we get a weak image of the beast, if we want to call it that. But because this message is rejected, this is, is not um, this empowered Sunday law. You can't say here that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down, except in a typical way, right? So we're just going to put Revelation 18 here because that's what Jones is saying. Yet he already knows that the third angel's message has been rejected, even though he's been presenting it. He knows it's been rejected. It hasn't done its work. He may not fully understand this, but he definitely knows this because he experienced it himself personally. Now, when we come down to our time, we can connect this history with our history. And, and we're going to do it these ways. We're going to have um, 1989, um, 2014, and 2019. Now, 2014 to 2019, we've, we've already acknowledged that this is um, in the week of Christ studies and so forth, that this period here, I mean, this is primarily the message of Parminder, but there's other things happening as well. So Parminder predicts a Sunday law here based upon 126 years, right? We already have recognized the 126 years here. The meaning, meaning, take all you farce. But we're saying um, we also have 126 years here, right? And how many years then is this all together from 1863 to 2019? Is there any significance in that? Okay, so if we're going to go from here to here, this is going to be 156 years, right? Correct? Did I do that math correctly? I believe so. Okay. And, and of course, we know if we go back here, uh, this is going to be 163 years, right? Because you're just adding 7 to 156. But can we take this 56 and match it to this 56 and this 63 and match it to this 63? That is, can we make a parallel? Between these seven years. Um, I did that right. And 
So is there a parallel between this history and our history is what I'm, I'm saying. I, I haven't thought about this before, so. I believe that's true. Okay. And we're going to have a Sunday law begin in 2019, a typical Sunday law, the pandemic. Right? Agreed. <clears throat> and of course, this is going to be in connection with our 777 structure. Um, so there's lots that's being addressed there. So we can see that this history here has a parallel to this history here, these five years, because we already connected these two. And since we have these five years here, we, we have to connect them here. So we can put the five years and the five years. So there's probably more to this structure than, I, than I'm seeing, but And we know that we're going to have a five and a two, right? Correct. Right. So that brings us back to the story of Joseph. So anything else? So can we see that the experience that Jones is having here is typical of what's been happening in our movement? But in our movement, we need to have this message of righteousness by faith accepted. Now, do we think we have, we already accept righteousness by faith? If I understood your, your question correctly, many would think so. Yeah, so most of most people would think we understand righteousness by faith. In fact, we're righteous, right? That's what people tend to think. Okay. Right? We're not Laodicean. We're not like other men are. Right? That's that's how we tend to think. But we don't recognize our spiritual condition. And Jones should have recognized that. This could not be the loud cry. I mean, maybe he was hoping it would happen. Maybe he was hoping that somehow seeing what's happening around them, people would awaken to the fact that they're not righteous and they need this message of righteousness by faith. They need this power, all of the power of God, to stand against all of the power of earth. Do we not, do we have a problem seeing this? Unfortunately, yes. Okay. Yeah, so we have a problem seeing our lack of power, which we shouldn't have a problem seeing because do we see God's power working in our lives all the time? Are we victorious in sin? Not that we would see ourselves as sinless. But are we constantly connected to this source of power? Do we see ourselves, our need of God, every morning? Do we feel that we cannot go on without God by our side every, every moment? Most of the time, we just go about our day using our own power. And we haven't connected to the power of God. We have this need of the Holy Spirit. And, and the work of the Holy Spirit is not just to give us power, but to convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So we would like to have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but we don't want to fulfill the conditions to have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What were the conditions that the disciples had to meet in order to have the Holy Spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost. Upper room experience. 
right? They had to see their, their sins and confess their sins to each other, the harm that they had done, their pride, their arrogance, their self-sufficiency. They had to confess all these things. They could not have received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit if that work first was not done by the Holy Spirit in their lives. And so this is the problem that we have. This is the problem that Jones is having, not necessarily personally, though probably to some degree, because of where his life went afterwards. But he understands this message. But this message is not accomplishing its work. And yet he expects that the loud cry has already happened, that, that the angel of Revelation 18 has come down in 1893. The angel of Revelation 18 doesn't come down until 2001. So there's a problem. But even in 2001, when we look at our history, we, we only recently have really understood what that meant. That is, in our history, 9-11 is not on Ellen White's big line. It is something that is a zoom into the Sunday law. We are in the Sunday law time since 9-11. But the Sunday law ha itself has not come. So this is a problem in our understanding. We need to be thoroughly aware of not only when we are in these lines, but our true spiritual condition, why we are not farther along in these lines than we had hoped to be. Through all the power of the earth, through, through all the power of the earth, though all the power of the earth be against the Sabbath of the Lord and against us for standing by it, the power of God is given to everyone who will be faithful to him. Right, so this angel coming down and adding his voice to the other angel makes the loud cry. So he says the angel has come down. It is not, is not the message that the Savior gave to his disciples, precisely the message that is given to us. They were to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Here is our message, the everlasting gospel, to preach unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It is the same thing. He said to them, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Here Jesus Christ has a power in the earth that is greater than all the powers of earth. So if Jesus was only in the earth and was living on the earth as he was once before, he would have more power than all the earth has besides. Anyway. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. Why? Go. Because he has the power. Go ye therefore and teach all nations these things. And lo, I am with you. Is he? Is he with us, brethren? Let us stop saying he will be with us. He does not say it. Let us stop saying it. It is not faith at all. We say, he says, I will be with you. And we ask him to be with us. And then we wonder whether he is or not. He says, go ye, I am with you. I am with you, right? Is he? Then thank him that it is so. If you get into difficulties, let him help you out. It is Satan's office to present difficulties, to hedge up the way. But thank the Lord. When the Lord is with us, Satan cannot hedge up the way. He may put a red sea in front of us. And though we will go, and through we will go, for God can open the sea. The Lord is with us, and we want it we want it a more personal thing than he will be. Anyway, we want a power with us every moment working with us, in us, and for us, and we want to be sure that it is so. How can we know it? He says so. Then let us say so too. So Jones wants to believe that he can take these promises of God and it can just be. 
and he's not wrong. But what's the problem? Can we just accept that God is going is with us if we're not with God? that presumption mm -hmm. so there's there's a problem that jones has and that he he can't acknowledge that the message of righteousness by faith could not have been empowered in 1888 or in 1893 by the angel coming down because the first and second angels messages had been rejected jones doesn't come to grips with this he probably doesn't even know that they were rejected. And he's not really going to see that until later, because later he will, at least to some degree, recognize that. Not, not so much in those words, but he's going to see that the church is going in a different direction, that 1893 is not going to bring about what he wanted. And for Jones personally, it was quite difficult seeing the message of 1888 rejected and seeing the direction that the church was going. It was quite a discouragement for him. It was quite a disappointment. And he just tried to make it happen. He wanted that message to be accepted. And, and so he, he didn't have the patience that he needed, and he didn't have the experience that he needed to see that happen. We want to power with us every moment, working with us, in us, and for us. And we want to be sure that it is so. How can we know it? He says so. Then let us say so, too. So you can see the problem there. We can't just say it's so if it's not so. Now, we can say God says it's so, so I'm going to believe that. I'm going to trust that it's so. That's not enough. It has to be so. Because it, as Heidi said, it can be presumption. There are two points that we have noticed thus far. One is that we are shut up to give the third angel's message as it reads. The other is that we are shut up to this one thing. That is certainly as we stand in our allegiance to the commandments of God, we have to do it in the face of all the power that this earth knows, with Satan using the power. And that shuts us up to this one thing that we need, therefore, in order to stand at all, in order to stand a minute. We need a power that is greater than all the power of this world put together. And the blessedness of it is that there he stands and says, I am with you, thank the Lord. Now, so we can see that this is correct in what he's talking about here. He's just at the wrong time. He doesn't understand the typical nature of what's happening in his own personal line. He believes that he's in the big line, that what Ellen White talked about, the angel of Revelation 18 coming down, the mighty angel coming down, has now occurred. But it hasn't. But that doesn't matter. We can still take what he says. And can we say that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down? And that we are in the Sunday law time and that we have a work to do, which is the proclamation of a message, which is tied to righteousness by faith in verity that is lived out in our lives. <clears throat> okay, now he's going to bring us back to the, the political issues of the day. So he says, now another thought. I think perhaps that will about fill the time for this evening and these three points will be enough for tonight. Congress did take up the fourth commandment, did make it the basis and the reasons for that Sunday legislation, but it went further. It did not let that commandment stay there as it reads. It did not leave the commandment there as God gave it. It did not leave the commandment there as it, as it is given in the Bible and as it was put into the record. It did not leave it there for the world's fair directory to interpret each man for himself as to what it means. Congress went beyond all that and interpreted the fourth commandment to mean the first day of the week commonly called Sunday as the Christian Sabbath, the Sabbath of the nation, and as that which should be observed and honored, 
for this nation and for the world by shutting the fair on Sunday. Then I ask, what is it? What is that but the government of the United States by a definite and decided act putting Sunday in the place of the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment? Let us look back a little now. The mystery of iniquity was working in Paul's day. The apostasy began. The apostasy went on. The church adopted Sunday. But could, but could she compel anybody to keep it? No. Could she bring any restrictions, any force? to bear upon people who would keep the Sabbath of the Lord, to compel them to put Sunday in the place of the Sabbath of the Lord, so long as the church stood alone. No, but she wanted to compel people to keep it instead of the Sabbath of the Lord. That apostate church wanted the Sunday Sabbath kept instead of the Sabbath of the Lord, and that people should recognize and observe it instead of the Sabbath. She could not do it alone. What then did she do to accomplish her purpose? She took hold of earthly power. She seized the power of the state. How much power did the government represent in the world at that time? The Roman Empire was the world power then. So that church then secured all the power of the world. And by that, she compelled people to receive Sunday instead of the Sabbath of the Lord. Then was it not by that act that she succeeded in definitely putting the Sunday in the place of the Sabbath of the Lord. But what was that but making void the law of God? She took the seal of his law, the heart of his law, that which reveals him, the seal showing that he is what he is. She by force took that away and put her own sign in its stead. And what was that but supplanting God in the minds of the people of the world? And it was by that act that she succeeded in her purpose of making void the law of God. That was the beast that made the beast. We have preached all these years that the papacy has made void the law of God. And that is correct. So let us return now to our own time and the question that is before us, have not the Protestant churches kept Sunday a long time? Have they not opposed the keeping of the Sabbath of the Lord a long time? But they could not compel uh, anybody to keep Sunday instead of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. In a measure, it is true. They could enforce the observance of Sunday in the states, but we know, and they have also confessed, that all efforts through state laws in this direction be almost wholly nullified by the fact that the national government was against it all. And we get to know that one of the great reasons for their strenuous effort to get the national government committed to Sunday was to make the state laws effective. And in order to make their purpose effective in exalting Sunday against the Sabbath of the Lord, these churches professed Protestantism had to seize the government of the United States, the power of this government, as the former apostasy seized the power of the Roman government. Now, of course, this didn't quite happen in Jones' day, but this is what we have always been looking for, the church to seize the power of the state to enforce the Sunday. So he says, and now she has got it, and in the definite act by which she got it, she aimed at the Sabbath of the fourth commandment to put it out of the way and to put the Sunday in instead. Then have not these, by this definite act, also made void the law of God when the other was done that was made by the beast? What is this? It is the image. Is it not time then for the third angel's message to be given in its own words? If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead and in his hand. Now, we're going to look at the rest of this tomorrow afternoon, uh, finish off this article. But when we think about um, what has happened with the pandemic, I mean, the state, uh, I mean, who's in charge? Was the papacy behind the pandemic? Is, it, is the pandemic about the Sunday law? Why, why do we say it's a type of the Sunday law? At well, least, government, over, government overreach used it. Okay, so, so this is the power of the state, and the state is just using its own power. Um, it's exercising its own power. It's not the church exercising the power of the state. 
we're, we're not arguing that the church is behind the pandemic. Are we? Now, the church supported the pandemic. And, and why did the church support the pandemic? We talked about this. Because of money. It did do with money. Right. So it had to do with money. It, it, that is, the church is beholden to the state. It's, it's, it, it has an alliance with the state because of the 501c3, right? Yeah. But the church isn't in control of the state. That is, the church didn't decide we need, we need a pandemic and we need a vaccine mandate, right? It did go along with it because otherwise it would lose its money. So it does have an alliance with the state. But we can't say the church is in control of the state. So why do we say the pandemic is a type of the Sunday law? Anybody? Why do we say it's a type of the Sunday law? What's our argument? <clears throat> because in order for the church to have the control that it wants, it must first see that the control has been exercised by the state. So the state is exercising the control that the church wants, right? Because we've had a constitution that would protect us from this power of the state. But now we can see that the constitution has been set aside, right? So now the church, and that's why I would say it's a type of the Sunday law, and it's it's preparing the ground for the Sunday law. But the idea here is that it's just a type of a Sunday law. Now, in Jones Day, the type of a Sunday law was actually a Sunday law, but it never had the power of the state behind it. That is, it was never enforced. Even though Jones uh, sees that the Constitution has been set aside, we don't have an enforced Sunday law in 1888 or 1893. In our time, we have that power of the state now being exercised with the setting side of the Constitution, but we don't have the Sunday attached to it. So there are some similarities. Now, and of course, he's going to say here, um, Ah, and the Lord has sent us a word just now too. It is time for thee, Lord, to work. Why? Because they have made void thy law. Um, we have 11.9 and 126. Right? Psalm 119, verse 126. That he quotes here. So he's quoting it at the right time, isn't he? He can't possibly know what he's representing here. So can we see that November 9th is connected to 1893 by 126 years? November 11th, 2019? Yeah. Right here in this verse. The symbolism is too hard to ignore. Yes. So we're going to pick this up again tomorrow afternoon. Of course, tomorrow morning, Dwight's going to be presenting and uh, at uh, 7 a.m., as we usually um, or 7.30 p.m. or 7.30 a.m. <laughs> Make we... up your mind as to what time. <laughs> no worries. Yes. So 7.30 a.m. Mountain Time uh, tomorrow morning. And then, and then we have to study tomorrow afternoon that we'll pick this up at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. So uh, let's close with a word of prayer.
Dear Father in heaven, um, we again are thankful for the Sabbath, and we just pray that uh, the Sabbath will indeed be a blessing. Thank you for the messages um, from Jones from 1893 that um, speak to today. And um, we just pray that uh, you can give us a good rest, that we can be refreshed in our study in the morning. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray.